Okay, I think we're set. Uh, thank you again for the uh, invite to come out here to ANSI. This is really a treat for me, and I'm really happy to share my research with you all today. Um, I'm going to be, first let me acknowledge my collaborators, Robert Wilhelmson, Bruce Lee, and Kathy Finley. And what we're trying to do here is essentially simulate the most devastating thunderstorms that exist, the ones that produce giant EF5 tornadoes. So I'm going to talk about the motivation of this work, how we're doing it, look at two different events, and then share some parting thoughts on uh, where our research is going. So we're trying to simulate thunderstorms that produce the most devastating tornadoes, so wind speed and, say, aerial coverage. So EF4, EF5, this is the top of the enhanced Fujita scale. We want to visualize these, storm, visualize these storms in ways that um, can, we can compare to field studies. This is very important to us. We want to be able to talk to obs observational meteorologists and, and compare our data to theirs. But we also want to do things that only models can do, where you can peer into the storm and see what's going on at very, very high resolution, both temporally and spatially. We want to know what's going on inside the storms that produce the most devastating storms as opposed to the ones that are less devastating. And the reason is um, over 90% of the fatalities occur in EF4 and EF5, either top of the line supercells. Uh, and the long track tornadoes offer the potential to produce more damage simply because they're on the ground more. Now, thankfully, most supercells don't produce EF4s and EF5s, but these are the ones we're trying to study. And why some storms produce no tornado versus a weak tornado versus a long track EF5? This is something that is really not known very well in uh, severe storms meteorology. We've made a lot of great strides uh, with field studies like Vortex and Vortex 2, where we can bring out radars and look at what's going on at very high resolution. Um, until recently, we really haven't had the computational technology to address the numerical side, but now with machines like Blue Waters and um, Yellowstone, we're able to do this. And this work is, uh, would not be possible if it weren't for supercomputing. So I very much agree with uh, Dr. Washington on this, that we need more infrastructure for supercomputers. This is a hodograph, a climatological study looking at uh, uh, hodographs of, of supercells that produce no tornado, uh, weak tornadoes, and strong tornadoes. And the length of the hodograph, the length of the wind shear vector is longer for the strong tornado cases. But notice how the, one, uh, the zero to one kilometer shear vector is much longer. This is just sort of one of the basic metrics we use to understand what's going on uh, with these storms. So lots of low level shear especially seems to be uh, important in the strongly tornadic storms. Uh, you also need a really good model to make this work. Thank you to George Bryan at NCAR who has provided CM1, which is an excellent model. It runs on supercomputers very well. You need a good set of initial conditions. In this case, we're looking at the 24 May 2011 uh, event, which was a long track EF5 in Oklahoma. I'm also starting to do simulation work on the 31 May 2013 storm that killed storm chaser Tim Samaras and some other folks. Very uh, amazing storm, 2.6 mile wide tornado, the widest ever uh, observed. And um, you, you, know, you also need to have the hardware and the software. So all these things have to come together. Blue Waters is a very nice machine. It's got very good, uh, you can see all the the cores it's got and the disk space. I had to write some code to manage data. In fact, I've spent most of my time doing data management, not science. This is hopefully going to change. And then you need tools to visualize the data because supercells are inherently three-dimensional and you really need good three-dimensional visualization tools. And Visit and Vapor have been absolutely <coughs> essential in this work. So we're using CM1 version 16. Um, it's 3D, non-hydrostatic, compressible, non-linear, time-dependent cloud model. Uh, it's designed to study these types of things. George Bryan does a lot of work with squall lines. That's how he at least started out. He's done hurricane work. He's done all sorts of great things with his model. Um, we're using Hugh Morrison's dual, mic dual moment microphysics. So this has uh, additional prognostic equations for number concentration. It's supposed to be a better way to handle uh, microphysics. Uh, he's also at NCAR. And I did a bunch of modifying uh, CM1, only the IO layer. I didn't do anything with the physics. Um, I eventually settled on HDF5 and uh, buffering rights to memory. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here's a, the size of the problem, about 1.8 billion grid points for the 24 May storm. I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about 30 meter isotropic inner mesh. I've recently started to do some higher resolution simulations in larger uh, numbers of points. So this is again on Blue Waters, about almost 8 billion grid points. Uh, I did a larger domain with this simulation and I'm now looking at uh, using the same uh, event, 31 May 2013, um, at the same uh, domain size, but at 20 meter isotropic resolution. So we're really trying to crank the resolution as high as we can to capture all the small vortices that are important to tornado, tornado formation. 
So how do you manage all this I.O.? And again, I've spent so many years just dealing with this problem in anticipation of this kind of simulation. So I devised a strategy where I split the files up, I name them a certain way, I split them across directories, I found that file systems generally like it if you don't put too many files in one directory and all these things make the files big. I use a lot of metadata sort of embedded in the file names but also in the HDF5 structure. Um, I, I buffer 50 to 200 time steps in each file, one file per node, not per core. This sort of makes the files big, doesn't make too many of them. I wrote some middleware in C to sort of uh, manage all this and then I sort of plug into that and I've written a paper that's going to be out soon in parallel computing that describes this a little bit more. So how do we configure the model? We're using fifth order advection, uh, Hugh Morrison's microphysics. For this simulation that produced the long track EFI, we're using Smagorinsky's uh, TKE. We're also using a, a, a TKE closure scheme for some other work. This is a friction free run, and this has raised some eyebrows in the, in the community for, for various reasons, but this is where we're starting. You have to start somewhere. Um, you climate guys look at this time step and probably cry because it's one fifth of a second um, or one seventh of a second to maintain uh, computational stability. Um, you use a good base state, and then how do you do it? You trigger the storm. We're using the updraft nudging technique of Naylor and Gilmore, so we're not using a warm bubble, which has typically been used in, in this kind of work. We're using a momentum source. And then you cross your fingers, you don't know what's going to happen. It's a model simulation, and you hope you get what you want. I spent a lot of years trying different soundings, different approaches. And then once you do get it, then you have to visualize the data in a way that makes sense. And if we could bring the lights down, if it's possible to bring the lights down for this next section, that would be great. So what I'm going to do show you next is a, a recent visualization of, um, of this storm. Uh, this was done by David Bach at NCSA. He's a, he's a visualizer, visualizing expert there. So this is showing you the model mesh. As you can see, the inner mesh and the outer mesh showing the stretch. We're going to superimpose the storm here. So this is a volume rendered cloud surface. So we're looking at cloud water plus cloud ice. We're going to tilt the box and show you what's going on here. So David's done an incredible job at making this storm look really good. I'm going to freeze it right about here where you can look edge on to the anvil and you can see the overshooting thunderstorm top here. Here's the mesocyclone. You can see lots of detail in the cloud structure here. Here's the forward flank of the storm and the rear flank of the storm. And there's the tornado. So this is during uh, the phase when the tornado is on the ground. It's churning along. It's going, it's an EF5 at this point and now we'll put it in motion. So again, we're not looking at the precipitation field so you can see more of a structure. Now, this is the best I've ever seen a thunderstorm rendered ever. So I, I tip my hat to David Bach. We submitted this to the Exceed uh, Visualization Showcase and it won the People's Choice Award, which was kind of nice. Um, but it looks really good. I, I love you Viz guys because you make my storms look good. <laughs> and, um, and this is really nice. And he's using things like shadowing. He has his own, his own sort of a custom built renderer. And it took about six to seven hours, I think, to render each frame. Uh, I think he used, uh, uh, you know, he did it, he parallelized in, uh, in time, not space. So, okay, I'm going to show you some more of this stuff, too. Um, so this is all created from history files, not in line. I know as we get to exascale, we're going to need to do stuff in line. Um, I use Visit to do, the, uh, to do much of the uh, volume rendering. Uh, this involves some work uh, to develop a plugin to interface with my data so I didn't have to do any conversion steps. Visit's nice, you can run it from the user interface, it's got a client server model, you can do your rendering on Blue Waters, you can visualize on your Mac laptop, at the, you know, wherever. Um, Vapor has a different infrastructure, it's much more tight, I think, to the, to the local hardware that you've got, it requires its own data format. It's very interactive, it's more like Viz 5 d which is, I went to school at UW-Madison where Viz 5 d was developed, so it reminds me of that. You tilt the box, it changes really fast, you can poke and prod and clip and do all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, it's very interactive. And for, for reasonably sized problems, it does a very good job. If you have a good graphics card, you have to have a nice graphics card. Both of these are absolutely indispensable for trying to figure out what's going on because this is highly unsteady three-dimensional flow. And you can't do 2D slices. And again, thank you developers. I, we couldn't do this without you. And you guys know who you are. <laughs> Um, some of you are in the audience. So anyway, what's about the storm? The storm produces a tornado. It's on the ground for almost two hours, and for much of its life cycle, it's creating winds over uh, or in the vicinity of 300 miles an hour, 130 meters per second. During this maintenance phase, there's a lot of different things that go on. I'm going to show you some more anim animations that sort of bring this to light. Um, the tornado spends most of its time wrapped in rain, as they say. That's sort of storm chaser lingo. So the, this, the tornado itself is... is uh, you can't see it too well if you're trying to observe a storm like this uh, observationally. 
You see lots of mesocyclones. These are basically small, tiny vortices that are kind of tightly wrapped up, and they move and merge along the leading edge of the forward flank downdraft boundary. I'll show you this shortly. Uh, we've identified a feature. Again, this wouldn't have been possible without looking at this in three dimensions. We're calling it the streamwise vorticity current. It seems to be associated, it's associated with these vortices, but it also is helping to, dr to drive the mesocyclone. And also, I'm, I'm recently looking at something I'm tentatively calling the streamwise vorticity sheet, which is a a sheet of streamwise vorticity where the vorticity vector and the wind vector are pointing in the same direction that or originates from very close to the ground. It seems to be feeding the tornado, uh, and that's some of the things we're looking at. Here's the sounding. Uh, lots of storm relative helicity, 360, uh, 0, 1, 710. You look at some of these energy helicity index is 17. That's crazy. Uh, CAPE, 4,300 joules per kilogram. Here's the boundary layer. You can see a residual uh, inversion, say, here. And then we just kind of go up the sounding. Here's the positive area. So you can see, wow, that's a lot, nice juicy CAPE. Um, here's the equilibrium level up here at about 160 millibars. So it's got lots of cape and lots of shear. These are things we've known for a long time are uh, good for, th for supercells. Here's the, the, uh, the hodograph. So here's the zero to 500 meters. Look at all that shear. Um, this is in meters per second. Here's one kilometer, two kilometers. So lots of, lots of shear. Okay, so here's the actual tornado track. We're looking at surface wind speed. This is ground relative, and this is a pressure deficit. So where you start to see getting into these dark reds, you're getting, this is meters per second. So you can see the tornado starts out sort of thin and weak, like you might expect. The pressure deficits are around 40 hectopascals or so. And then it just starts to widen and strengthen. This feature here is associated with that streamwise vorticity current. It seems to be a real surge from the north that feeds the, uh, feeds the system. And here's uh, the pressure deficit. So easily 100 millibars, hectopascals if you prefer, deficit down to 150 or so. Uh, just churning along, uh, you know, I'm, this is pretty much the first time that this kind of tornado has been simulated as, that I, as far as I know. Uh, there's an interesting event that occurs when an anticyclonic vortex that's sort of kicked up from the rear flank of the storm spins around and sort of strips away vorticity from the tornado and it never quite recovers. It's still an EF4, EF5, but you can see that it's more, uh, trans is more in unsteady, it's not as steady as it was. Uh, this is a trace of the wind speed, ground relative. You can't see the scale exactly right. This is 130 meters per second. There's one spike here that's associated with a couple of uh, vortex events. This is pressure deficit, so we're getting down to 120 millibars, 140 millibar pressure deficit. So it's a very strong tornado. Um, I'm going to look at the genesis, maintenance, and decay phase, or dissipation phase. So at the genesis, which is very important, we've been studying genesis a lot, see this, this is the surface horizontal vorticity and surface horizontal uh, wind vectors. And notice how they're pointed in the same direction. So these are interpolated to the first model level. This is the forward fl rear flank uh, of the storm. This is the rear flank downdraft boundary. This inset area I'll show in, this is the updraft. And, but notice, notice though, the, these vectors are pointed in the same direction. That's streamwise vorticity. It's really amazing how, how it is almost everywhere streamwise, and this is near the ground. So this is focused in on this region. This blue is the pressure trace of the tornado. So this is shortly after the tornado is formed. This red is uh, vertical vorticity. Red is positive. So these are vort little mesocyclones that are moving along the forward flank downdraft boundary, and they're basically emerging with the tornado, and it's gathering this. It's sort of gathering all this vorticity. That's part of what's going on. It's not all of it. We see this SVC, the streamwise vorticity current, strengthen along that boundary, and it's tilted into the updraft, providing vertical vorticity. So here's the forward flank. This is just a volume rendered uh, vorticity magnitude, okay? So you can imagine the air going this way. This is the SVC. You've got horizontal vorticity being tilted. It's going to become vertical. These are all these little mesocyclones, and this arrow points to the, this is going to become the tornado. This is going to become a long track EF5. This guy is actually an anticyclonic tornado that is interesting. I haven't looked at it too much yet. So you get lots of uh, vortex merger events going on here. You see the tornado sort of form along its length almost instantaneously over a few seconds. This is not the dynamic pipe effect in, in effect here. So this is at time equals right here, and, and you can see this, this red vortex here where the arrows are pointed to is, is what's going to become the tornado. 40 seconds later, you can see it's strengthened a bit. The blue guys are anticyclonic, the red guys are cyclonic. So I'm coloring the vorticity magnitude with the vertical component of vorticity. So you can see all the vorticity, but you can discern negative uh, anticyclonic from cyclonic. So you do see a fair amount of blue stuff in here. So there's some sort of anticyclonic vorticity going on. But you can see that this vortex just sort of gets wider and it gets stronger. And, and this happens rather quickly, and this is the streamwise vorticity current that's sort of feeding the updraft. Uh, this is clipped at two, two kilometers, two kilometers high in this. 
So this is the process of, 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 of genesis. Here is just wind vectors moving. I'm, I'm originating the parcels very close to the ground. They're colored by the magnitude of the wind. So you're seeing that this sort of sheet of vorticity is just kind of being wrapped in and it's sort of wrapping into this tornado. Um, this is the rear flank of the storm. So this is where you're seeing the, the rear flank gust front. And the forward flank doesn't really look like a gust front. It just looks like a boundary. So this is the SVC, the sort of sheet over here. And you see it, the sheet at the surface wrapping into a tornado. And I'm going to drop a lot of parcels in this, in these, in this simulation. You'll see uh, this air is really going straight into the tornado. So one interesting discovery, at least tentative discovery, is that most of the air that feeds the tornado is actually negatively buoyant. It's coming from the cold pool. It's not coming from ahead of the storm. But the cold pool air is not that cold. It's sort of in that Goldilocks zone. It's negatively buoyant, which is important because you have to generate horizontal vorticity, but it's not so cold that you can't lift it. So here is uh, using vapor here. I'm looking at vorticity magnitude again. This is just a, a vertical plane of pressure perturbation. So the, when you see the white here, that is you know, low pressure. I wanted to see if the SVC itself is associated with low pressure, and it is. So you're seeing all this horizontal vorticity being consolidated and being lifted into the storm. And then you start to see all these little vortex mergers. This is just before Genesis. And now we look at Genesis. So this guy right here is going to be our tornado. This is anti-cyclonic tornado. Uh, and look at all these guys just coming together. It's just striking. And again, this is what you need this, this great software for, so you can really see the three-dimensional aspect of this. You've got two things going on, vortex mergers, vortex consolidation, and the tilting of a more diffuse area, but larger area of horizontal vorticity into the vertical. And that's definitely helping to provide that vorticity to the mesocyclone, which is helping to somehow drive the tornado. But you'll notice they're, they're decoupled. You're not seeing them at the same location. During the maintenance phase, this is about 40 minutes later, I just wanted to show you the, the regime. Again, here's the forward flank downdraft boundary. It's the same basic regime. Here's the SVC, here's these vortices. Now the RFD is kicking in more uh, turbulent air, uh, but the tornado is just basically saying, okay, I'll take you and I'll lift you up because the tornado at this point is a two-celled tornado. So there's an updraft encircling the tornado and there's a downdraft in the center, and I'll show that in a minute. But this is the regime. It's very stable. It seems to just continue to churn along for a long time. And that's exciting because now we can sort of develop a conceptual model of what's going on. So I designed this, uh, this movie to look at what it, looks, what it would sort of look like if you were viewing it from afar. So this is going to show precipitation. It's going to show rain and cloud. You can see the tornado form. It descends. Uh, the to tornado condensation funnel descends. Uh, you can see an uh, interesting feature here. The rain wraps around the tornado mesocyclone. This is air streaming in. This is like SVC air from the, from the forward flank of the storm. It's being tilted in. Um, this is the rear flank. You see all these blasts of downdraft air. Uh, but, and this is running at 60 times real time, by the way. So this is 60x. It's like your fingers on the, on the fast forward button of your, uh, your DVR. And it just turns along, and it goes and goes and goes. Um, and you, know, you can see some interesting subtornadic flow here. There's these like, vortical things going on around the, uh, the wall cloud. I've talked to a couple of uh, observational meteorologists who have said that there's some things here that they've seen in the field. So that's encouraging. We're working on a manuscript to sort of bring this all together, describe it. But it just goes and goes. And it's actually very gratifying how, how nice the simulation is compared to, to compared to observations. So this actual event, 24 May 2011, was sampled. Hauser et al. and some other folks at Howie Bluestein's group went out there and they actually saw some things that look similar to what we're seeing as well for, uh, for the genesis phase at least. So over the maintenance phase, when it's just churning along, we see some modulations in the cold pool in the SVC where it kind of gets stronger and weaker, warmer and cooler. The RFD is very unsteady. We see some very low theta E air near the surface, which needs to be explained. Um, Anticyclonic vortices originating along the FF down, forward flank downdraft boundary actually disrupt the tornado. So here again is vorticity magnitude colored by the vertical component. During the maintenance phase, here's a tornado. So the blue guys are anticyclonic, the red, the red and yellow guys are cyclonic. There's a whole parade of them that gets sort of swept into here. Here's the RFD, which is just a mess of spaghetti. It's very turbulent, lots of vorticity, but it's kind of disorganized. And here's the SVC. This is during the strongest winds you see. And right here at this point, this is an anticyclonic vortex, and this is a site, the tornado. And they sort of, like two gears interacting, they sort of, you see a very strong uh, a mag magnitude of wind spike there. Here's a tornado up to 10 kilometers. So this is vorticity magnitude colored by the, the vertical component. I've focused on uh, higher values of vorticity so you can see the tornado better. Here's the SVC, here's a couple of those. This is the downdraft in the center of a tornado. So blue here is negatively, is air sinking. So this is a two-cell two tornado, this is pressure deficit. So you're seeing a low pressure associated with the SVC over here and the tornado here, and you can see that it's undergoing vortex breakdown. 
uh, which is very, I've uh, been seen in the laboratory for a long time. So you have these twin rotating vortices that are sort of like a barber pole, sort of spinning around one another and a downdraft in the center. And this goes all the way up to 10 kilometers. You can see a signature of a tornado. Uh, later on, again, this is like a half hour later, it looks pretty similar. Same basic regime, SVC, tornado, and then lots of little mesocyclones. So I'm going to focus now on, uh, this is the surface uh, co is the uh, negative uh, theta perturbation, so negatively buoyant air is blue. Here's the tornado, here's some of these vortex mergers, here's just the inset of the cloud. I wanted to just sort of focus in on, this is every two seconds now, I'm stepping through much slower. This is the vortex breakdown occurring. So it happens very fast. Even two second data isn't high enough resolution temporally to make it look smooth. <laughs> you know, you have to save data even more frequently. Um, but you can see that things are moving quite quickly. Um, and, but it's definitely vortex breakdown, which is, uh, which is encouraging because this is what we have uh, thought has occurred in real tornadoes. Um, this is an interesting event. This is an anticyclonic vortex. I guess it's, you'd call it a tornado maybe. It's sort of consolidation. Watch what happens as this guy sort of sweeps around the tornado. So at this point, it's, it's a strong EF5. But this guy gets sort of vectored around the outer circulation of the tornado cyclone, and this little red guy gets scooped around. There's lots of stuff going on. And then it just gets, it strengthens, and then it gets lifted, and it gets tilted. And it strips away, so it's, at least that's what it looks like to me, it strips away some of the vorticity or the circulation of the tornado. And this is the point at which I showed on that trace where it starts to weaken. It, it stays going, but it weakens a bit. Now I'm going to drop trajectories. This is in the SVC region. This is in the, the sort of the forward flank uh, cold pool, and this is in the rear flank cold pool. So you'll notice immediately that the air in the, in the cold pool is pretty much sweeping right into the tornado. You'll see that pretty clearly. The, the uh, SVC air is not. It's basically behind the tornado, about a kilometer behind, but it's providing vertical vorticity to the mesocyclone. Now this interaction has not yet been explored, but it's, it's clear that this is not the tornado. It's not like merging directly with it. Somehow, there's a, there's a, we have to put all the pieces together here. RFD air, uh, you can see pulses in the RFD by sort of deformations in the, in the, par in the uh, parcels. We're, we're releasing parcels every two seconds, by the way, so they just keep on going. This is, again, vapor, which is really good for this sort of thing. You can see the, the air rising around the tornado. This is the updraft um, sort of shooting out ahead from the RFD, but the tornado just turns along, and the, and the uh, SVC just kind of turns along, and it just goes and goes and goes. Um, we'll take another view of the same trajectory set, so we're looking at it from the rear perspective. So this is, again, the, R, the R FFD air, and watch it just go, boom, right up into the tornado. The SVC air, is, is this is horizontal vorticity, and then it's being tilted into the vertical. Uh, and, and that's what, what supercells are all about, vertical vorticity in the mesocyclone. And you can see this weaker vortex here, uh, that anticyclonic tornado showing up in the RFD, and haven't really figured out what's going on here either. But anyway, you'll notice that air is in the, in the inner part of a tornado, um, not in where the downdraft is in the center of it because it's two-celled, but the air in the tornado is definitely coming from the cold side. And that's an interesting result, and it's an important result if this holds out to be true in, in, in the field. And again, models are not perfect. There's some issues we have to work out, but there's some interesting things going on. I mentioned modulations in the storm in the SVC. So this is vorticity magnitude again, using sort of a lower threshold for vorticity magnitude. So here's the tornado and here's the SVC, but notice how it just kind of, it, over time, it kind of goes away. You don't see as much vertical, vert, horizontal vorticity, but the tornado keeps going. So this tells me you don't need the SVC to be strong to maintain the tornado. I think the tornado is still getting most of its vorticity from this sheet near the surface. But then it sort of kicks in again. And then it really, it looks beautiful. I mean, you can see the rotation. I, you know, I, a, a video is worth a million words, I guess. But I mean, it just shows it. You can just see it turning horizontally. And this is probably one of my favorite sequences here. I'm just dropping parcels in the SVC. The tornado's over here churning along. And you just watch it. I mean, it, it tells the story. Uh, that air is being lifted, and lifted into the vertical. And it's that, that vorticity has gone from a horizontal to a vertical state and it's certainly helping to provide uh, vorticity to the meso. Now, this is not exactly a new result. The idea that streamlined vorticity being tilted into the vertical is, is not a new result. This is something that's been known for a long time. However, we've never seen it with this kind of fidelity and, and showing that it's kind of consolidated and this sort of thing. And I want to be clear about that. This is not a completely unknown result. Uh, we've known that for a while, but it's never been really seen this clearly, I think, before. So, all good things come to a close at some point. The tornado becomes engulfed in rain. It becomes occluded, as we say. It gets positioned well within the cold pool. The, the cold pool starts to get warmer, actually. The, the streamwise vorticity sheet breaks down, and the tornado actually dissipates very rapidly, almost instantaneously along its length. 
So here I'm just uh, I'm rendering as ISO surfaces vorticity magnitude. Here's the tornado. The volume rendered surface is rain, and the cold pool is blue for cold, and green and, and red is warm. And you see the tornado just gets pummeled with rain for a little bit here. You can see, I don't know what, what's the chicken and egg scenario. Is the rain forcing the downdraft, or is there some other things going on? But boom, it just gets plowed, and now it just breaks down. I mean, now it's, it's all essentially gone, and then gone. And that happens very rapidly. This doesn't just, as they say in, you know, they often talk about tornadoes roping out and becoming horizontal. That doesn't happen in this simulation. It just dies very quickly. This is actually each grid point. You're seeing the horizontal uh, storm relative wind vector. So it looks like a tornado. It's going along. Looks pretty good, and then boom. Uh, it just dies like in a nice downburst, a very localized downburst, and then it just, it's gone. So the tornado dissipates over the course of like a minute. And this has been seen in the field, but it's not, the, I don't think it's the most common form of tornado death. <laughs> Usually they, they die a bit slower. So okay, this is one event. The 31 May 13 event is, is probably the most famous tornado in history, at least right now. Uh, 2.6 mile wide tornado, it happened two years ago. It was crazy, it moved in a weird way, it did all sorts of weird things. So I'm gonna try to model this sucker. I didn't really think I had a chance in the world of getting anything that looked right. I tried using analysis data from the RAP model, tried using proximity so soundings. Then I decided, I talked to Glenn Romine and NCAR, so you NCAR folks are awesome in so many ways. Um, I tried running off the 12Z GFS analysis. I did a wharf simulation on my cluster, I ran it at three kilometers. And I got some, I started to see supercells pop up, so I wrote an NCL script and I plucked out a whole bunch of soundings and I looked for good ones, okay? So I went hunting for the right conditions. And I picked the one that I'll show in a second. It also has lots of cape, lots of shear. Um, it's a, a, you know, here's well-mixed boundary layer, dry air loft here. Here's the hotograph. Um, let's see, storm relative helicity, 150, not as high as the other storm. Uh, here is the hotograph. So, you know, again, that strong shear, zero to one kilometer, very long vector. And then you can see it, 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 it clockwise turning as you'd expect. Here's a comparison of the two soundings. So the, uh, in this case, the red one is 24 May and the blue one is 31 May. Here's the comparison of the hotograph. So they have some similarities, but some pretty strong differences as well. So I ran this at 30 meters. I ran it at, at lower resolution and tried to, you know, sort of getting to a higher resolution, and I got a wide tornado, and I got some subvortices. So this, this storm was, in reality, was, con was showed a lot of weirdness. Very big wide tornado engulfed in rain and lots of small vortices, and I got something that looks at least relatively similar in, in terms of the general storm mode. So in this case, I'm looking at pressure deficit and vorticity magnitude, and here's the cold pool, here's the point of occlusion. The tornado is well positioned within the cold pool. Um, here's a volume rendered uh, rain, and here's the blue surface is the tornado, so I'm trying to show that it is, yes, it's engulfed in rain. Uh, this is a second tornado or a second subvortex. I don't know what to call it. Here's from a 20 meter simulation. Here's a wide tornado. Uh, this is pressure deficit being rendered. Another tornado here, one here, one here. I don't know if you'd call these tornadoes, suction vortices, I don't know what you'd call them, but it's, this is encouraging. So my parting thoughts here, this is something we can do now. Okay, we can do these high resolution simulations and get tornadoes to form in supercells. This is something that we've done this to some extent in the past, but now we can do it, I think, at much higher fidelity. Um, this approach with the 31 May storm of using WARF as a bridge between NCEP data and, and CM1 for the highly idealized simulation, I'm gonna pursue this for more events. Is this streamwise vorticity current a thing? Does it exist in nature? What about this sheet of vorticity? If they're there, how do we find them? They're located in very inconvenient parts of the storm that you're gonna to have to use in, probably in situ or maybe LIDAR or something to get. It's very dangerous. And there are issues here. We have to incorporate surface friction into the simulations. Um, I won't go at length about that. We have to in include centrifuging into our uh, dynamics in order to get the rain out of the tornado. I didn't talk about that much. It doesn't seem to be a huge issue, but we've got lots of work to do. I do put some of these talks up online. This one will make its way up there eventually. If you want to look at some of this stuff, uh, go right ahead. And uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. We have time for a couple of quick questions for one lady. This is very nice talk. I was wondering, you mentioned when you were simulating the point of view, to cross your fingers. Yes. And in some times you mentioned choosing the right soundings. Um, I presume this means you often choose cases which don't involve tornadoes. And do, uh, do you learn something from that about what are the conditions needed for uh, the 
tornadoes versus uh, nothing happening? It's really easy to simulate a supercell, but doesn't produce a tornado. I've been doing it for years and years. Okay, it's the ones, this is really, it's very easy. So yes, we're gonna learn something, but we have so few cases where they do produce the strong tornadoes. So this is what I'm focusing on mostly now because it's the science that hasn't really been done yet to this extent. But I've got plenty of cases where they don't. In fact, I'm gonna spend a lot of time trying to to make this tornado die. I'm gonna to try to introduce things into it to try to break it. So that's an important thing as well. The first storm especially seems to be very, it enters this steady mode that, um, that I wanna see if I can break it. But yes, we need a whole spectrum of simulations. So again, supercomputing resources, not just one simulation, a hero run as they call it, but we need dozens at that resolution. Some produce, some don't, and then you can do statistical analyses. It's gonna take these tools we've been talking about for this conference, these you know, massively parallel tools to go in and do statistical analysis. There's just so much to be done, but absolutely, we need to do simulations of non-tornadic, tornadic, and uh, in between. We'll be doing that. Questions? I'll ask one quick one. Lee, do you see a predicted capability being something in the future, and what would have to happen in terms of the computation and resources? Great question, yes, and that's always the goal in this kind of work. We want to be able to uh, you know, warn people of storms. These features like the SVC and the SVS and some of the vorticity that forms before the tornado is actually on the ground, um, it's going to take some very high resolution radar uh, to, to detect those types of things. Um, if these dynamical regimes are favored in certain environments, then maybe we can look for it in the soundings before the storms form. Um, but it's going to take a long time. We first have to verify that some of the things in the simulation are occurring in nature. And if, they, if we verify that, then we can start to look for these features and explain. If we can link something in the environment pre-storm to what's going to happen, that is a huge bonus. Because right now we typically issue a tornado warning. And we just say, there's going to be a tornado, right? We usually don't say there's going to be an EF5 tornado that's going to be on the ground for a long time. If we could do that, the general public would, would have less of the cry wolf syndrome and say, oh, this isn't just a tornado warning, this is a devastating long track tornado, you need to get away or go to your shelter or whatever. And if we can warn like two hours in advance, then people can evacuate. Some of these events where, where the guy on TV says, oh, you all want to head south or something, then the roads get clogged and the 31 May event was, was just a tragedy. I mean, it, there were so many things that could have gone wrong. But ultimately, yes, we're looking for indicators in the data before the storm forms or just as the storm forms that can help us predict what kind of tornado it's going to produce or not. So yes, absolutely. Thank you. Let's go. Thank you again.